morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Robert Fritz, and uh, really happy to be here. We're going to talk about leadership and structural dynamics. Let me just start with something really pretty basic, which is great leadership makes all the difference. But the converse of that is also true. Leaders are embedded in structures that have certain structural tendencies. And quite frankly, if you don't change the underlying structures, uh, any change effort will, be, uh, will not last. In fact, if anything, the organization will reject the change like a body rejects an implanted organ. Here's a common pattern. Someone's not performing well in a position. Everything is tried to tra change the situation, make them better, try to improve their uh, performance. Nothing works. Eventually, the person is replaced. And six months later, the new person is performing like the predecessor. How many people have had an experience like that in your professional life? You just raise your hand for a moment. Look around. Just raise your hand and look around. Because if you haven't had that experience, notice that many people have. It's a very common experience. Well, in this example, the structure is more causally dominant than people's talents and abilities, their good intentions, their past experience, their creativity, and their capacity for innovation, and a whole host of other really great attributes that they may have as individuals in a different structure. I remember uh, one of the... <laughs> One of uh, the funny little bits of uh, the fifth discipline is uh, when Peter writes, you take a group of people who have very high IQs, you know, 125, 130, 140, and you put them together in an organization, and the collective IQ goes down to 60 or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about the way certain things are structured that can either bring out the best in people, but quite often and too often bring out the worst in people. What's the implication? Everything that we say about human motivation is not as influential as the underlying structures people are in. I really think that's a pretty amazing insight. What do we talk about? What do we say it's important? Why do people do what they do? Here's the things that we say are causal. DNA and genetics, psychology, it's your gender, it's your generation, it's your education, it's your biochemistry, uh, profile types as in Meyer-Briggs. I mean, it's really interesting to see how people try to do Meyer-Briggs tests and then they uh, try to fill positions based on personality types and they have no understanding at all what's going on in the underlying structure that would give rise to patterns of behavior, no matter what personality type we put into that behavior, put in that position. Do you know, I could take somebody who's got theoretically the wrong personality type and put them in a structure that's really well designed and that person's going to perform brilliantly because it's not about personality type. It's about structure giving rise to patterns of behavior, including cultural background, including if, you know, some people think it might be at your astrology or at your numerology. It doesn't really matter what you think it is. The underlying structure will be much more causally dominant than all of those kinds of things that we always talk about. And here's some basics about structural dynamics. A lot of this will be familiar to you. But in system dynamics, the unit really is the feedback loop. So we have positive and negative feedback loops. And they combine to uh, create a system. And, and uh, by the way, uh, my development of this work was directly influenced by the work that uh, we originally did in Innovation Associates and my work with Peter. And there's really two sources for uh, for this, that I've, this work that I've developed. One is system dynamics and the other is music. Uh, and particularly uh, a lot of the work of Karl Heinz Stockhausen, who's a German composer who I studied with years ago. And um, in those two threads together, for me, uh, you know, kind of opened up a new door. And, and for me, that door begins with this as a unit of measurement is this tension resolution system. Tension is formed by contrast or difference. This is technically what it is. It's not just anything. You know, because, of course, by tension, we're not talking about stress, pressure, anxiety. 
Uh, we're talking about the relationship of something to something else. And the resolution of the tension ends the contrast or the difference. So the key to this, why it's a dynamic, why it actually works the way it does, is because structure seeks equilibrium. Well, guess what? That's exactly the same dynamic in systems. You know, if you understand this principle, that structure is always seeking equilibrium, it's not necessarily going to be able to accomplish it. Or systems always seek equilibrium. Think about compensating feedback. You push down on a, you put, push down on a system and it pushes back, it's compensating because the system itself is striving for equilibrium. In other words, the end of all differences in a way, the homogenation of, or the resolution of all tensions. And that's a dynamic, and that's why that's so powerful. We can use that dynamic, by the way. There's nothing inherently good or bad about equilibrium or states removed from equilibrium. But it's really important to know that the structure is always going to be striving for it. Resolution is equilibrium. All contrasts and differences are resolved. So here's a couple of examples. There's two types of structures that, uh, two types of behaviors that structure produces uh, generally. And one is advancement, and the other is oscillation. Advancement, things move forward, oscillations like a rocking chair. You move forward, and because you've moved forward, something happens in that structure that creates a state of uh, non-equilibrium, for those of you who are purists, I know it's degrees removed from equilibrium, since equilibrium is a pure state. But, you know, among friends we can say non-equilibrium. So you get into the state of non-equilibrium and then it will move back because that is the path of least resistance. That is where energy finds it's easiest to go. And in nature, in physics, uh, energy always moves where it's easiest for it to go. That's all it can do. When I use, by the way, the phrase, it's so crazy sometimes, you know, somebody will, will say to me, you know, Robert, I really like your book, The Path of Least Resistance, you know, the easy way out, it's terrific. <laughs> and you, know, you kind of scratch your head and wonder if you should give it up. Uh, it really, I'm using it in the scientific sense, the physics sense, that energy always moves along the path of least resistance. If in the path of least resistance you get to a certain point and it's easier to move away from that point, you will move away from that point. And you know what? It has nothing to do with your good intentions, your personality, how well you mean uh, uh, or, or how good you are because the underlying structure is going to be dominant. Oscillation. Here's some examples that we see this over and over in our organizations. People build up capacity, then downsize, then build up capacity, then downsize, then build up capacity, then downsize. Okay, so it takes maybe two, three years to go through one cycle of build up capacity and then maybe a couple of years of downsizing and then a couple of years of building up capacity. But next thing you know, the, the um, organization, in terms of their capacity, has had tremendous oscillation and very hard to build a foundation upon a rocking chair. Here's one uh, that happens a lot, uh, particularly as various um, organizational um, pro uh, methodologies come in and out of FAD. Uh, people centralize decision making, and then they decentralize decision making, and then they centralize decision making, and then they decentralize decision making. Or uh, some companies go on acquisition sprees, they buy everything in sight, and then they divest, and then they acquire, and then they divest. Or in one minute they're customer focused, and the next minute they're shareholder focused, and then they're back to customer focused, and then they're back to shareholder focus, and then they're focused on the long term, and then they're pulled back into the short term, and then long term and that short term. Or they're going after quality, and then they shift to cost management, and they go to quality again, and they go to cost management. And you know, you can watch this over and over and over in some of our largest organizations, and it seems like nobody happens to be noticing that there's a predictable pattern going on that you can call two years in advance. Because if, if you understand the underlying structure, you know that if they're in a rocking chair, if they're moving in one direction, and the underlying structure of that, uh, of that structure, the underlying structure of that structure, okay, that's probably right, even though it sounds wrong. 
is to move away from where you are, you will, you'll have a reversal. And that's why when I started uh, working in organizations, uh, it, it was uh, <laughs> uh, with uh, Charlie Kiefer and, and Peter Sangi and myself, and, and when I first started working in organizations, I was the guy who sat in the back of the room and got coffee for everybody while I was kind of learning things, which was really great. But one of the first things that shocked me, because I came from the music world, was that success did not succeed in organizations. I mean, I thought, gosh, you know, musicians can be crazy, but boy, these corporate people. <laughs> and the thing is that you would think success would succeed. Well, let me give you one example. Uh, this was uh, DEC, um, digital computer. And um, they had a policy that in essence said, if you invent something at a plant, you're going to get rewarded. So people would be inventing really terrific things at various plants. But no one ever got rewarded. There was no reward system for taking somebody, somebody else's idea and putting it in your plant. So what would happen is all these great ideas would never get planted in other you know, places because people were busy, busily trying to get credit for their own thing. And this is an example of the opposite of a learning organization, isn't it? Now, in structural dynamics, there are two basic forms in relationship to structures that give rise to advancement or oscillation. And the simplest is the tension resolution system. A very simple tension, which will be formed by a difference between something and something else. Uh, invariably, we try to organize that um, consciously as a desired outcome and current reality, structural tension. And the resolution of that tension is when the desired state is the same as the actual state. And that's a very simple tension resolution system. Not necessarily, by the way, simple to create, but a simple structure. Uh, but here's often what happens instead of that is that we have two competing tension resolution systems in which the points of resolution are mutually exclusive. In other words, as you move toward one, it resolves, but it exacerbates tension on the other. Here's a couple of examples. First one's not a business example, it's just a kind of a life example. Hunger is a tension caused by the difference between the amount of food the body desires and the amount of food it has. That creates the tension. Every time we have a tension, there'll be a difference or a contrast between something and something else. Usually it's a uh, similarity and difference. For example, it might be hot and cold, and they're both temperature. But there's a difference there. One's hot, one's cold. In this case, there's the amount, desired amount of food is different from the actual amount of food. And the way we, we resolve that is we eat. And when we eat, the desired amount of food becomes the same as the actual amount of food. That's the resolution of that tension. But sometimes there's a competing tension resolution system. For example, if we're overweight, which means, here's the tension, there's a, there's a difference between what we desire to weigh and what we actually weigh. And that tension will often be resolved by going on a diet. And if the diet's successful, we will have the desired amount of weight and the actual amount of weight be the same. And that resolves that tension. But there's a way that these two systems are inextricably tied. First of all, when we go back to that hunger, it's not simply hunger, but there's something in the apostat which uh, governs how much fat we store. And the reason it has this part of the brain is because when we, 10,000 years ago, or however many years ago that was, uh, we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. And so we would eat voraciously when we found something and store fat uh, for the winter to make sure we didn't starve. Now, the brain hasn't caught up to modern life. And when you go on a diet, what happens is your brain gets starvation messages and with less food, and this is just absolutely terrible, with less food you store more fat. I mean, isn't that awful? How many people here have tried to go on diets and then you lost weight, but then you gained weight back. Do you know that 85% of people who go on diets 
end up gaining more weight at the end of that process than they had before they did the diet. And you could say, well, gosh, you know, therefore dieting causes weight gain. And in a funny way, it does. But let me show you how that kind of works. Uh, actually, I'm going, to show you the, I'm going to show it to you in the next example. So here's a business one. We have shareholders return on investment, which has become the modern mantra of what people wrongly think the purpose of the company is. But you hear them being sold as bill of goods. You know, our purpose is shareholders return on investment. Well, if that's the case, what happens is we, we avoid investing in capacity. We underfund our enterprise. But what that will do is hurt customer satisfaction. And so as we start to lose market, the next thing that happens is there's a shift of dominance to that next competing tension resolution system. And suddenly people were going to invest in capacity so we can have satisfied customers. And as we begin to do that, then we get complaints from Wall Street about shareholders' return on investment. Now, imagine there are two rubber bands, one tied to this uh, imaginary wall over here, and one tied to this imaginary wall over here. And uh, on this wall is written shareholders' return on investment, and on this wall is written customer satisfaction, and these are two different rubber bands. Now, watch what happens when I begin to move toward satisfying customers by investing in capacity. Well, the rubber band over here, this tension resolution system, is actually now relaxed or resolved. But this one, at this point, is at the point of most non-equilibrium. This is the point of most tension. And just to make sure I know that you're listening, everybody point to where it is easier for me to go right now in this structure. Just please do it. Good, thank you so much. It makes me feel so good knowing that you're with me here. Yes, and you will do that because that's the path of least resistance. But now as we start to move toward satisfying shareholder return on investment, we begin to underfund our enterprise. And again, customers are going to... Uh, not be satisfied and will go away and we'll have to address that. And so you see these oscillating patterns and this is the underlying structure that's causing or giving rise to these patterns. Moving in one direction leads to moving in the other direction, the opposite direction. Here's, here's one way of, uh, of uh, seeing this. It's, it's so, you know, I'm going to say it technically and I think you'll get it because of your background and system dynamics. The point in this structure of having successfully accomplished one of your major goals is the point in the structure of most non-equilibrium. It's the least stable. It's the point where you cannot sustain that over time. And that's why movement in one direction will lead to movement in the opposite direction. You cannot sustain success. Here's uh, the key to changing the structure. And it is to establish hierarchy. Now, when I talk about hierarchy, I, I'm really not talking about the cliche of hierarchical, stupid stove uh, pipe management uh, that is positional. I'm talking about some things are actually more important than other things. Some things are dominant and some things are subdominant. And now we're going to start to really hone in on what the leadership dimension is to the, uh, to the structure because it becomes so important. The strategic question is which of the competing tension resolution systems will be primary? We, in other words, the key to this is really to designate which of these two competing systems will be primary. That's the job of a leader. By the way, this is one of the things that too often we see leaders not doing. We see them trying to make everything kind of equally work. They stand on the fence. 
They don't intervene when they need to, and it does take intervention to choose hierarchy here. To just say, okay, look, for our organization, this is gonna be more important than that, or that's gonna be more important than this, and we're gonna organize around that. That becomes our organizing principle. So for those people who are in this particular structural conflict, if you're the leader, there's one question you have to sort out if you are to do anything but oscillate, and that is to decide which is higher, which is more important, shareholder return on investment or customer satisfaction. By the way, it will always be customer satisfaction, and I'm gonna prove that to you in a couple of minutes. But I just wanna give you the answer before we go any further. <laughs> so leaders have to do a few things. Here's some things I think it takes. Uh, and the first is strength of character. Now, I think there's a lot of things that can be taught about leadership skills and various uh, approaches toward leadership. And this one, I, I'm literally, not so sure that it can be taught or can be acquired. Now, I don't know that it can't be, I just don't know. And, and I mean literally, I don't know. So, but I have seen the great leaders have strength of character. They, are, they really will confront and face tough issues. They won't shy away and they won't play politics and they won't, they won't have mixed motives. Like here's an example of a mixed motive doing the right thing for the company on the one hand and having everybody love me on the other. That's often a mixed motive. Uh, working with the structural forces. And again, this is a, a point that uh, I think was so beautifully made uh, when Peter was talking about who has more influence over a ship, the captain or the ship's designers. And of course, both roles are important. We need the command decision. But we also, though, know that the designers of the ship are gonna have much more influence because that will determine how the ship can move through the water. And finally, uh, uh, shared structural tension as a leadership um, approach. I'm gonna talk more about all of this stuff in just a bit. Here it is. The key to business strategy, make them an offer they can't refuse. And I don't mean in the godfather sense. Make them an offer they can't refuse because it's so great. That is a great business strategy. Now, of course, there's more to it, like making sure they can get it and making sure they know about it. And, you know, there's, there's a few other things. But, you know, this is essential. With, with this, we can build an incredible co company and maybe an industry. But without it, we're selling snake oil in some degree or other. Steve Jobs said, <clears throat> killer products bring killer profits. So I was reading this article uh, about Steve in uh, Business Week, and he said, he said, you know how you go to the auto um, fair, you know, the, uh, what's the, you know what I mean, the auto uh, big show, huh? Yeah, a big car show, you know, all the, and they have the concept car, and everybody falls in love with the concept car. And then a couple of years later, the concept car comes out, and it's not the same thing at all. Nobody likes it, no, everybody, no one buys it. He said, what happened? He said, well, the concept car, got brought to the engineers, and the engineers said, well, you can't do that. And then they brought it to the designers, and the designer says, well, you can't do that. And little by little, this concept car, what everybody loved, got compromised down to something that nobody loved. So this is, uh, you know, if you were, um, by the way, I don't know Steve Jobs at all, and uh, uh, so it's not like I'm talking about my best buddy here. But, if, you're, uh, if you work for Steve Jobs and Steve says, here's the thing we're gonna do, and you say, well, you know, Steve, you can't do that because the engineering, he'd say, well, thanks very much, it's been nice knowing you, I wish you well in your career, and I'm gonna go find somebody who's gonna say yes. Because he understands this principle. I think that's strength of character. Maybe it's obsessively 
you know, something else, but I don't think so. I think it's, that's part of the real visionary, is he, he's going for it. He can see things that people can't see yet. Let me give you a couple of examples. He doesn't give people what they want. He gives people what they will want, but don't know they want. That's vision. You know, this is not like putting together a, a focus group and everybody gets together and decides, oh, yeah, I guess we'll all have it pink or something. <laughs> Uh, he's, he's imagining what isn't there. So here's the iPod, wipes out the Walkman. I heard the CEO of Sony say, we were caught by surprise. You know, there were MP3 players before the iPod. Sony had a really good one. What Steve Jobs did is he figured out what they're used for. So he wasn't making a machine. He was making a music distribution system. And because he understood that, he made deals with all the record companies. He set up iTunes. He uh, had the right price point, And he built this amazing business that nobody else had thought of doing. I mean, before that, they had Napster, which was basically stealing files, copyright infringement. And he made it legal by giving the royal companies their due, making it a good business deal for everybody and making it convenient for everybody to have music they want where they want it, which was the whole point of why people wanted these little machines. Uh, the iPhone uh, challenged uh, all of the successful phone companies. One of my clients uh, makes name tags for things like Motorola tele uh, uh, cell phones and uh, no 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 Nokia, and you know, all the major things, and there, um, orders went down dramatically when the iPhone went out because the iPhone was just wiping out the industry. Why? Because he saw things that people wanted before they knew they wanted it. When he came out with it, suddenly he was a dominant market player. It's really extraordinary leadership. Now, um, just to show you a little bit of compositional technique in terms of how do you put this organization together, to, how do you compose the organization? And it is what I describe as object-oriented management. Object-oriented management is like object-oriented programming. And the object, in this case, is a structural tension chart. And I'm, and I'm going to show you telescoping in a minute and how to use that. Uh, but here's the principle of structural tension. You basically have a desired outcome. And by the way, this would be a structural tension chart, not just structural tension, but actually a chart of one of the ways that we, uh, we record the information. So we have a desired outcome, we have current reality, we have the action steps, that creates a tension. And remember, that tension is not a metaphor. That's a dynamic. And great leaders hold that tension. And so we certainly have to always know what is it that we want to create where, where, and where are we now in relationship to that. So tension, by the way, is not a gap. You know, I kind of <laughs> laugh when I hear that, that it's a gap. Um, I'm not a great harmonica player. Okay. <clears throat> but, uh, and if I had a piano, I'd, I'd do this with a piano. But I'm going to play a tension resolution system. And you tell me when you hear the gap. Did you hear a gap? Anybody hear a gap? Good. <laughs> we don't have a gap. We have a presence of tension. So, you know, we're not having nothing in there. There's something in there. And the something in there is a dynamic. And that strives for resolution. So, you know, we're not talking about something here that's metaphorical or nice. We're talking about something that's powerful, causal. Because as we hold that tension, it will strive for resolution. Our minds will begin to become creative. We'll start to work it. We will have the energy. We'll have the foresight. We'll have the stamina to move from here to there because tension seeks resolution. So as it's moving toward equilibrium, as it's moving toward resolution, that becomes a dynamic so that you're no longer pushing rocks uphill, but in fact, you're working with the forces in play. A gap is an absence of something. It's a matter of orientation. You know, one of the things also that we really try to help people do is move from a problem orientation 
to a, a, an outcome or a creating orientation. People, managers, love problem solving. You got a nice juicy problem, you don't have to think. The problem kind of organizes you, and you feel like you're doing something important. The thing about it is that, uh, see, structural tension, you can actually resolve it. But with problem solving, or um, often it's conflict driven, you have this cycle where conflict drives action, which then reduces the conflict, which then leads to uh, less future action. Change motivated by conflict will always be temporary. That's an oscillating pattern. People will mobilize in times of war, but they never stay together after the war. Uh, I remember somebody saying that uh, Americans have the attention span of a gnat. And the comment was about fundraising for some worthy cause. And the worthy cause was trying to be motivated through conflict. He didn't understand the underlying structure is, if you drive the conflict, eventually people will take action to reduce the conflict. And once they've taken that action, their motivation to act in the future has gone down. And so it'll always be temporary. This is why you know, people will watch a program on CNN on diabetes. And it'll scare the you know, daylights out of them. And they'll change their diet for a week or two. And then a week or two later, they're back to the races to eating what they used to because the motivation of reacting against the conflict has been reduced by the actions they've taken, which then led to further less conflict, which led to further less motivation. Change motivated by desired outcomes can lead to permanent change and almost invariably will be an advancing pattern. You can solve all of your problems and still not have what you want. Right? Just kind of let this sit for a second, okay? Because I know some people get very, I remember I was talking to a, uh, this lovely guy from Harvard. He taught a management class at Harvard. And after I was um, through with my talk, he came over and he said, I'm really struggling with this problem solving thing. And I said, well, why are you struggling? It's so simple. You know, problem solving is not creating and problem solving, taking action to have something go away and you can solve all your problems and still not have what you want. What's so hard about that? And he said, nothing's hard about it. I just hate, hate it because I've been teaching problem solving for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you, you know, fair enough. But, that is, but get, you know, God bless the guy. He really was thinking it through, though. So if you actually reorient your thinking, so if somebody comes to you and say, boss, I got this problem, and we've trained the folks in our client organizations to, to try this. Wait, before you tell me about the problem, what's the outcome we're trying to achieve? Okay, and where are we now in relationship to that? Which would include the problems, but also the good, the bad, and the ugly, include everything. And then how are, how are we moving from here to there? And then the, a different kind of discussion happens, which is a discussion that's about creating this outcome, not about solving the problem. And we may, in fact, have, as one of the things we do, solve the problem, but that's not the motivation. The motivation is to accomplish our desired end result. So we have a desire for an outcome which leads to an action which continues until the result is achieved. And what do we need in the creative process? A clear idea of what we want to create and a clear idea of where we are. Now, it's easy for me to say that. The discipline it takes to be clear about what we want and to be clear about what we have is a lot of discipline, and it's not natural. All disciplines are not natural, and this is not natural. It's natural to avoid conflict. It's natural to try to not hurt each other and, and, and not address things that are really wrong. It's na human nature, we want to avoid emotional conflict. Professionalism, but even though we want to avoid it, on behalf of the thing that we want to create, we are willing to address it as a secondary choice to our primary choice of successfully creating what matters to us. Shared vision is powerful. That's one of the fifth disciplines, one of the five disciplines. But it's even more powerful is shared structural tension. So I have shared vision, but I also have shared current reality. And I may even also have shared action plan between here and there. So we have a collective focus on desired outcome 
and a collective focus on reality. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Am I seeing what you're seeing? And if we're not seeing it together, if we're, we're not aligned about how we're seeing it, how are we to understand what you're seeing? How am I to understand what I'm seeing? What are you, what are you seeing that I'm not? What am I seeing that you're not? And then we have a real dialogue that's motivated by us trying to explore reality in relationship, not just any old reality, but reality in relationship to our desired outcome. Like a, an archer stretching the bow, aiming the arrow, that's structural tension. Look, if I didn't have enough tension, I couldn't get the arrow to the target. Everyone is holding it. Collective, shared structural tension. Okay. Okay, look, here's, um, I'm just going to show you a little bit about the object-oriented uh, uh, programming and how we organize that. So a structural tension chart will have the desired outcome or strategic objective or goals or something we want. It'll have current reality described in the bottom. It'll have action steps. It'll have uh, due dates for the outcome overall. Uh, every one of the action steps will have a due date and an accountability. Okay, so that is basically the object. Now, object-oriented program, you take an object and you put it in different places in the program and you, you have different content. But because the form is the same, you can multiply uh, a very sophisticated program fairly easily because of object-oriented programming. Anybody here do object-oriented programming? Okay, well, I, that's how it works. <laughs> And this is how it works here, too. I mean, it's a really interesting thing. Where I can go anywhere in the organization and say to somebody, what is the outcome you're after? Where are we now? What actions are you taking? What are the due dates? Who's accountable? How's it going? Et cetera, et cetera. That form actually organizes our thought process. And uh, the object, so there's the object, is actually the structural tension chart. And telescoping is uh, sometimes we have a master structural tension chart where we have a bunch of actions. Uh, and one of those actions, each one of those actions, can be telescoped out to a new structural tension chart. So a second level structural tension chart. So it will have its action step, well, let's say it's a marketing campaign, uh, then the details will be developed, marketing campaign by whatever the date is, current reality is whatever is in, so for the marketing campaign, action steps, accountabilities. And that way you have an integrated, it's very much like a relational database versus, an in, versus a non-relational database. Where things actually, it's, it's a, such, so wonderful because you have a high degree of sophisticated organization without ever micromanaging anybody. I mean, people can really do use their talents or imagination, do, do whatever they need to do. We're not telling them how to do it, but they are able to uh, know exactly what their role is within a larger creative process. Now, lastly, this is the last point I want to make. And it's, again, one of the places where I see the failure of leadership um, chronically, and it is the executive team. And often, it's, there's a disconnect between the CEO or whoever the managing director is and the exec team. You know, this is like real world stuff. This is what we see. And what has to happen is that leader, the CEO or managing director, whoever it is, that exec team has got to be aligned. <clears throat> because if they're not aligned, it's not going to happen anywhere else in the organization. This is another dimension of leadership. In fact, this is the first critical test of leadership, that good teams, alignment, and division of managerial disciplines beautifully uh, aligned, and bad teams is there's always power politics, competitive, uh, uh, competitive goings on, turf wars, people undermining each other, or just simply ignoring the uh, executive team. Uh, uh, the, the CEO, and sometimes it's because the CEO, him or herself, has, trying to, has a conflict or mixed motives trying to have everybody like that person and trying to do a good job, and sometimes those are mutually exclusive. 
So um, I'm just going to quickly put it all together here. Leadership is critical. Leaders are subject to the structures they're in. Without a change of underlying structure, change efforts will be reversed. That's if it's an oscillating pattern, by the way. Uh, structural conflicts can be addressed through hierarchy. Uh, it's, that hierarchy is a leadership decision. Uh, many leaders are pressured to think short-term. Short-term thinking without a sense of long-term vision will hurt the organization. Uh, the purpose of a company is not shareholder return on investment, no matter how much Wall Street tries to convince us it is. Uh, maximizing profits undermines the company's ability to grow and better compete in the marketplace. The key to business strategy begins with making an offer they can't refuse. Composing the organization aligns resources systems toward a common direction. Shared vision is good, shared structural tension even better. The senior most person <clears throat> needs to have an executive team that is aligned and masterful in implementing the strategies. Too often the executive team is the first dimension to undermine strategic alignment. Leaders are needed throughout the organization. This is not a point I've made up to this point but one that I think is uh, important to, uh, to articulate. That, it, you know, we, well, I'm talking today about senior most leadership because often people don't talk about that. We kind of speak in general terms and kind of ignore the obvious, which is the senior most, per, uh, senior most group of people are not really doing their jobs. But when they do their jobs, what's available now is a, a dissemination of leadership, a multiplication and amplification of leadership throughout the organization. And that becomes golden. That's unbelievably uh, wonderful to see. Uh, structural tension as an object gives them direction and coordination. Here's how you can take complexity and organize it very simply into both a unified and aligned uh, direction, yet have all of the freedom in the world to express your talents and your, and your creativity and your imagination. Leaders need to think in terms of outcomes and not problems. Uh, one job of the leader is to build capacity for the future. Great leadership makes all the difference. Okay, well, anyway, you get the point. All right, so uh, thank you so much. It's been a great talk.